Hello and welcome to the Nerd Writer Podcast, movie review edition. Uh, this is the first podcast that I'm attempting to do. I love podcasts. I love listening to them. I just think there's something special about them. I love audio. I love really great audio. I love listening to the human voice when it's nice, clo- nice and close to a really good mic. So I'm going to try a podcast here. I just got out of the movie Looper, and I want to talk about that today. I'm not going to do percentages. You can do Rotten Tomatoes for that. I'm not going to do stars. You can do Roger Ebert for that. I just want to talk about the movie. And I think that I do have the qualifications to talk about movies because I was a film student. I know a little bit about what goes into making a movie. I've tried writing short films. I even tried uh, getting my hand, trying to do a feature a couple years ago. Didn't work out, but I at least know what it takes. So I have all that much more respect for Ryan Johnson, the director of Looper and writer who composed this time travel story. Oh, and I want to mention before I start, I haven't read anything about this. I haven't seen any reviews, haven't read any reviews. I don't know what Rotten Tomatoes even gave it, which is strange for me. I usually always check before I go. I know what some friends have said, and the reviews have been in the, all in the range of good, some really good, some great, some lukewarm, but still mostly positive. So I really enjoyed it. I had a great time watching the movie. The experience of watching it was a lot of fun. The first the first half hour to an hour of the movie, I thought, was just flawless storytelling. Really quick, getting all the information out there that you need. The uh, world that they're living in, 2044, is explained in the process of the story. Future Movies that are set in the future can sometimes get caught up in explaining the world that they're living in. I, and I don't think that Looper falls uh, into that trap. I think that the elements of the future, the future technologies that you're shown, the way that the world is, are done as a, a, a sort of a side glance to the story proper. And I think that the world is very interesting. There's a few sort of technological changes that you see, things that you might expect, nothing too ridiculous. But also, you get the sense that this is a dystopian future. The 2044 of this world is something has gone wrong in the period of time in between. Maybe something not terrible has gone wrong. They they make one reference to the vagrant raids of the something something. So government or the ability to police whatever city that this story is set in is sort of broken down a little bit. Seems like the crime bosses have control of the town, people are getting shot, you know, out near buses for whatever reason, because, you know, they're trying to steal something. Um, So it's not a place that you'd maybe want to live, unless, that is, you were a looper. And I think that the character of the looper is very interesting. Uh, And I'm realizing things as I, as I just thinking about this movie, having seen it, which I think is going to happen in the next couple days, which which is a mark of of a good movie. One of the things is, that these loopers are people who are not really thinking about their future, right? They go to the same bar every day. They get paid for their job killing people from the future. And they're doing the same drugs. You know, when I was, for those those of us who went to college, I used to call this the haze. You just do the same things over and over again. And it felt like, frankly, a loop, right? The same night, the same weekend over and over again, you lose track of time, you lose track of yourself. And I think that is something that the loopers in this movie are definitely going through, symbolized by the fact that one of the key elements is something called closing the loop, where the bosses in the future have somehow deemed it cleaning their own hands of loose ends. They've sent back these kid loopers when they're older, 30 years in the future, to kill themselves. You don't know that it's going to be them because they're, you know, bagged on the head, but these kids, these loopers, don't, they really don't have a future. They have 30 years, and that's it. So there's a layer there. There's a subtext there of, are these people's lives anything more than what they do? The montage in the beginning does a lot of that for you. Um, and the, the way that the drug, for example, this drop in your eye is filmed is just really, really stylistic and smart. And I think that is something that is shown throughout the whole movie. But moving on. Oh, and I probably should mention, there's going to be spoilers in this, so if you haven't seen it, I'd say stop listening right now and and go out and see it. It is worth your money to see. So things start to get a little bit more intense, more serious, when Joseph Gordon-Levitt's character 
played by Bruce Willis, his future self comes back to the past, and they show in a montage of the years intervening what happens to him. He goes to China, does some more killing, but then he eventually falls in love with this Asian woman who, he says, saves him, right? saves him from this life. Now, there's potentially troubling thing in this to begin with, which is the fact that Joseph Gordon-Levitt is a murderer. He's murdered people who he doesn't know that they've done something bad. Even if we decided that murdering people was okay, he doesn't know that they've done something bad. He's just taking the he's taking the word of the bosses in the future that they want them dead. So he doesn't re, it's 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 hard already to sympathize with him in the beginning. That will become much much harder for the Bruce Willis character later in the movie, but we'll get to that. The main criticism I have with time travel movies and this movie is that depending on what the movie is, you can sort of get a sense, you get the feeling towards the end that the movie is trying to figure itself out. Time travel movies are so much about, the writing of them is so much about closing all the loop, the loose ends, making sure that it's logical, that it works, right? Especially ones that are explicitly about time travel like Looper. Now, of course, you can't close out every loose end with time travel movies. We always take things for granted. For example, we know that it's not logical that only small things would change for the future Bruce Willis when little things change in the present of the movie, when he cuts his arm. We know that little moments in the future affect big consequences, or little moments in the present affect big consequences in the future. The the, the butterfly effect, the chaos effect. So all of these things, being at, the, being at that bar to meet that Asian woman who he eventually marries, those things don't happen after a, a little thing like uh, the, the, just a small misstep in the in, in another direction um, happens. But we let those things go in time travel movies because if we didn't, we wouldn't be able to have time travel movies. It just wouldn't work, right? Um, Back to the Future, a great time travel movie. The the picture disappearing thing is, you know, when 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 their existence becomes questionable, they disappear in the picture. That is ridiculous, but because it's like it goes from the head, <laughs> goes from the head down to the to the feet, the last thing that they get, it's just ridiculous. But we let it go because we know that some liberties have to be taken. And and it's, it's a good example that these two movies are good are good to compare against each other because the time travel elements in Back to the Future are very campy to begin with. And, and it's a very campy movie. And Back to the Future spends a lot of time on the character and the story in the past of Marty and the parents and all that stuff even though time travel is the wrapping that is all around it. Looper is one of these movies in the line of Inception, Dark Knight, the Chris Nolan type of movies where everything has to be sort of airtight, watertight, right? This is really realistic. This is what would happen. This is how it would be. My main criticism of Looper in in that vein is that you feel at the end of the movie the time travel elements of the story spinning themselves to their proper conclusion. And that, for me, takes away from the character development, which, which for a great movie, is always, always the center of the story. Um, not to say that there aren't great characters in this movie. I think that Joseph Gordon-Levitt, Bruce Willis, uh, and Emily Blunt do great acting jobs for their characters, but there are a few things that sort of go wonky in the third act. First, when Bruce Willis kills that kid, whatever sy- sympathy you had for him immediately goes away. We know from Ryan Johnson, the director's choice, early on, that the fact that he doesn't show Emily Blunt's child's face the first three times we see him, we know that he's the Rainmaker. That's something that I don't think he's trying to hide from us. Um, And the fact that we know that means that the first kid that Bruce Willis kills is an innocent child. And even though he feels remorse about it afterwards, it's hard for us to sympathize with Bruce Willis again. I don't know if that's Ryan Ryan, Ryan Johnson's intention for us to sympathize, but we don't do it after that. Excuse me, taking a drink here. And then we have that almost, what essentially is Bruce Willis becomes John McClane from Die Hard and starts ripping people apart with machine guns and semi-automatic guns, just killing scores and scores of people. This guy is lost to our empathetic urges, right? He can't get what he wants. You cannot build a love so strong to justify for the viewer the murder that he commits in the end of that movie. And and I, like I said before, it's already hard with Joseph Gordon-Levitt character. Oh, and one thing 
by the way, that I mentioned, that I noticed, that I don't think the person who was watching it with noticed, um, which I thought was an interesting little thing. Uh, so the punk kid who's got the gat, who really shouldn't be allowed to have any kind of gun because he's ridiculous. That's Jeff Daniels from the future, from, from the present. That's Jeff Daniels' past self. I think the way that you can tell, the way that I noticed it was when Jeff Daniels died and he's sort of looking at him, really sad. The next thing he sees on the wall is the map where Joseph Gordon-Levitt is, and there's a circle on the map, and I think that is supposed to symbolize closing the loop. So well done, Ryan Johnson, on that. That's That was a good little moment. I think I'm right about that. I could be wrong. So when Joseph Gordon-Levitt kills himself in the end and is able to change the Rainmaker's future to be, presumably he's going to become good now, whatever, him... The process, the, 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 the moment of him killing himself, to me, felt unsatisfying. The reason was because I felt the time travel elements overshadowing the character elements. There had to be an end to this story that worked. For a, a fallen character like Joseph Gordon-Levitt, killing yourself is really the only way to go, first of all. So you already have that. Second of all, what happens? You know, Bruce Willis cannot be made to get back with the Asian woman, his wife. Joseph Gordon-Levitt is going to go on to live with Emily Blunt and the kid, right? So this is really the only ending of the movie that there could be. And there are a lot of really great movies, I should mention, that have fallen characters, low-life characters. But it's broadcast very early on about those characters that they won't make it. And you know it a good distance from the end. The fact that Ryan Johnson tries to keep up his suspense, like maybe Joseph Gordon-Levitt might make it, I think actually takes away from the movie. Because it would be a, a sort of, I think it just would be an empty feeling if he got to live. I think that's the trap the movie gets into. It would be an empty feeling for the viewer if he got to live. It's hard to redeem that kind of character. But he didn't make him a tragic character early, on, early enough in the movie. So you're sort of vacillating between the two sides. Will he make it? Well, that's not going to feel great. But he's not telling me that he's not going to make it. So that's really my main criticism of the movie, um, is that the characters are subsumed by the plot elements of making a time travel story work. All that said, really, really enjoyable movie. I mean, one thing that was fantastic, the sound editing, sound mixing. Wow, amazing. I don't know who did it, but you did a great job, and you should be nominated for an Oscar, because I thought that the way that the story moved along with sound was brilliant. And despite the problems I had with the end of it, it just, that that really just precludes it from becoming a great movie from a really, really good movie. So I think that if you haven't seen it, which would be ridiculous at this point because I've spoiled all of it, but if you haven't, go see it. It's worth the money to go see. That's the review I have of Looper. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it wasn't too long. And if you want, if you, you know, leave, please leave in comments what you think about this if you want me to do more of them. It's a lot of fun. And I will see you next time. <laughs>